Good day, and welcome to the Plant Engineering Webcast, Avoiding Profit Killers in Maintenance and Operations, brought to you by CFE Media and Technology and sponsored by Dude Solutions. I'm Kevin Parker, an editor with Plant Engineering Magazine. Here are some tips to help you get the most from today's webcast. If you're experiencing issues with your slides or audio, refresh the browser or click the Refresh Media button directly under the presenter's headshot. You can control the volume of this webcast by adjusting the volume on your computer or on the webcast platform. If you are having technical problems with audio or the slide presentation, click on the question mark at the top right hand corner of your screen to access a list of system checks to try before contacting an online technician. If you do need a technician, type a message in the ask a question box and someone will get to you as quickly as possible. Type questions for our speaker in the Ask a Question box on the left-hand side of your screen. The live Q&A session will begin after the presentation concludes. Today's webcast is being recorded. You'll receive an email within a week with the link to the on-demand event. To download a certificate of completion, a PDF copy of the presentation, and additional resources, use the Event Resources tab on the left-hand side of the screen. Those documents will also be available with the on-demand version of the webcast. You can also learn more and register for the Dude Solutions virtual booth visit located in the tab on the top of your screen. I'm now happy to introduce today's presenter, Paul Lachance. Paul Lachance has devoted his career in support of optimizing maintenance teams by enabling data-driven decisions and actionable insights. He wrote his first CMMS system in 2004 and has since designed and directed CMMS and EAM systems. A regular speaker at national trade shows, he's been featured at IMTS, Fabtech, and SMRP and been published in industry magazines. He currently serves as the Senior Manufacturing Advisor for Dude Solution. Paul, thanks for joining us today and please go ahead. Thank you, Kevin, and it's an honor to be here to present today, um, Avoiding Profit Killers and Maintenance Operations. The agenda we're going to go through today, talk about what a maintenance professional, how, how maintenance professionals help with profitability. What are some best practices and methodologies we can use to help that process? We'll touch on the pandemic and how that has shaped the future of maintenance operations, and probably most importantly, how can you get started? Uh, this is a part of a three-part series, with this being the middle pillar uh, around best practices and methodologies. Um, we'll be able to provide links for uh, the software and technology and or the future services one we'll be doing today. So let's start off by a discussion on what do maintenance people do? There's this legacy perspective uh, and when I first got started in my professional career around manufacturing and maintenance operations, this seemed to be the common description of maintenance people just simply were there to fix broken assets. They kind of came out of their basement office, grimy, they're, nobody's happy to see them because there's probably downtime involved. Um, and they would fix their thing and they'd go back off. And totally an underfunded cost center, really in their own silo. And, and most egregiously sad, in my opinion, is an underappreciated part of our organization. Fortunately, this has changed. And today, in the, in, in the modern perspective, and I think this will be here forever, is maintenance people are just as responsible for organizations' success as anybody in the organization. Increased organization and production capacity. They really can help drive improvements to that. Uh, maintenance people are integrated with many departments, including production and engineering and finance and IT. And they are just as much responsible for profitability as any other part of an organization. For example, Let's just say your organization needs a 10% increase in production to match demand. And I understand there's probably a lot of you on this call today who are in the opposite situation. So you could translate this to maybe you need to try to control costs and you're trying to figure out how we can eke that out better through maintenance operations. But if you do need to have a 10% increase in production, one of the common ways people think to do that is you run more shifts, you expand your production line, you're going to add more assets, people run more hours in the day so that you can meet up with that demand. 
there is just as good an option to increase your uptime from an arbitrary here 89 to 94 percent and get those same benefits and that same value and match that demand a heck of a lot easier and less expensive on your organization. So maintenance people are really in many ways the unsung heroes of your organization that come in, not only save the day when they're fixing some critical downtime, but help you really be a more lean and efficient organization. Just a bit about Dude Solutions here. We've been around for, we just celebrated our 20th birthday. Uh, well, there's about five or 600 uh, in our organization, really around the country, around the world now, uh, with a total focus on maintenance-related operations. Today, we'll be featuring our Asset Essentials CMMS EAM solution. Um, if you want to know more about us, there'll be a link to, to reach out later. So what are the profit killers? I'm going to break them down into four buckets for the purpose of today's presentation. Labor, it's all about overtime, uh, which is a big profit killer. But there's also things like an improper balance of work or not having the right people or right contractor for an appropriate job, ineffectiveness. Parts, the dreaded stockout or what it, otherwise known as missing that critical spare part when you have downtime. That is a really big profit killer, and you really want to avoid that. But there's others like poor ordering, poor management of parts, loss, missing, and theft. Asset-related profit killers with the king and queen of all downtime, unexpected, unplanned downtime. But there's also poor quality or scrap and rework. Uh, too much energy usage because of poorly maintained assets. And another one that can be really killer uh, is premature retirement uh, of your assets. And finally, compliance, so fees and fines, insurance hikes, bad will because of that. I'd like to start with a, our first poll of the day today. You will see on your screen um, a poll question, which I'll read you um, while we're doing this. If you could take a moment to... Uh, if you could take a moment to answer this, whether it's labor, I think you can do any or all here, overtime and balance, the proper balance of work, or parts, uh, that would be the stock outs, or assets with downtime being the king of that, or compliance related issues. Which of these has impacted you the most? So we're going to go ahead and let people um, take another couple of moments to start to answer these questions. I still see some coming in, so I'm going to let everybody have another moment to do it. Okay, I think we probably have enough time coming in here, so we'll go ahead and show these results to the audience. Uh, but just to review them, it's a nice balance here. I mean, the word nice is maybe not the best way to describe that, but it's a pretty good balance between labor parts and assets with some users are talking about compliance, and those are a particularly um, dreaded profit killer, but fortunately for this audience today, not quite as prevalent, but a nice uh, pretty much uh, one-third, one-third, one-third breakdown between all of those. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and continue with the presentation. Thank you for taking that poll. So industry statistics, I'm not going to read every one of these stats on this screen here, but it is absolutely proven that organizations that properly deploy a CMMS, Computerized Maintenance Management System, or maybe you can say EIM if you like that phrase, will experience improvements to their profitability, primarily driven through cost reductions. Some of the ones to highlight on here, reliability of your equipment. I mean, you're just making your equipment much more effective. You're, improve, you're increasing by 28% maintenance productivity. 20% reduction of downtime. That right there will pay for CMMS over and over and over again. You can read the rest of the statistics here, and we're going to go through examples of these, but you, you, you will see that it makes very much dollars sense to implement CMMS through the cost reductions. CMMS is really the, the key to your source because it's where you're going to get a lot of your information related to your maintenance operations. If you're driving that asset on the left, that old car, and, you're, and you start to hear a rattle or a shake or you start to smell something, how are you going to tell? You've got a couple of little dials on that dashboard. 
The car on the right, you know everything that is going on with that vehicle. You know exactly what the problems are, and you'll be able to diagnose and get a correction on that quicker. That is going to catch catastrophic problems a lot earlier. CMMS acts the same way for the assets within your organization. It's loaded with different metrics and data to help you do this. So today's lecture is about avoiding profit killers through best practices and methodologies. So there are many pains and there are many tools. And I wanna be clear about this presentation today. Maybe you are an organization that is already going through a Six Sigma and you wanna know more about how maintenance operations can help you with that, or 5S or TPM. Um, today's lecture is a high level overall orientation with focus on where maintenance operations might cross over. And I'm just gonna strongly emphasize that you spend follow-up time researching some of these if you're not familiar with them or you've been thinking about them uh, as we go through this process. It's all about continuous improvement. It's all about lean manufacturing and lean operations. Every one of these will bring you back to that. So we're gonna spend a, a couple moments on several of these with a deeper dive into total productive maintenance. And starting with 5S. 5S is one of my particular favorites. It's a, it's a lifestyle thing. I think many of us, especially in this pandemic, uh, we're spending a lot more time in our house and we have much more, I know me, I have my attic, my basement, my garage, everything is much more organized. We can carry those methodologies into our manufacturing environment, into our maintenance operations. So it's a methodology to pr pr promote a clean, uncluttered, safe, and well-organized workplace. Um, it's been around for a long time, goes back to 16th century, then a shipbuilding is one, of, but it was popularized by Toyota Motors. You're gonna hear Japanese manufacturing industry, um, automobile industry is behind a lot of these wonderful methodologies and best practices. But it involves these five S's, sort, set in order, shine, standardize, and sustain. Sort, just basically removing all unnecessary items from your location, or at least placing them, that's the set in order, in optimal position. You see the screen on the left and you see the screen on the right. Who wouldn't want to be working in that environment on the right? It's so much more efficient. It's better for mind, body, and efficiency to have it that way. Many of us, the same way our garages and attics can get out of hand, our, our workplaces can do the same thing. So sort and set in order is just get everything organized. Shine, it's all about getting things clean, cleaning and inspecting the workplace tools and machinery. Growing up on boats and spending a lot of time on sailboats as a, an adult, I've always had a phrase driven into me from my father is, uh, ha a clean boat is a happy boat. And that's so true for today's factory. How are you gonna tell on that screen on the left if there's a problem with that asset, if there's a leak? You've gotta get things clean and organized and set in place, shine them, so that you can really be more efficient in your operations and especially to identify problems. Standardize, just make this become uh, a standard process, document it. You can see from that screen right there how serious they've documented their processes. And finally, sustain or self-disciplined. Sh this should become a natural process or quote, do without being told. This is a way of life. Uh, to operate in this with this 5S methodology. And it can help drive profitability. It's going to eliminate waste. You will produce higher quality uh, output of your products. You're going to increase productivity. Greater employee satisfaction. And, you know, people don't want to work in a sloppy environment. It's not good for you mentally. It's not good for you physically. It creates a safer work environment. All of this is going to reduce costs, and it's going to drive profitability. CMMS, uh, the software can help you in this process in a number of ways by helping you with cleaning instructions and so forth. Um, profitability spotlight, you know, whether this is directly related to 5S or general, but as you start to reduce how long it takes you to do a corrective maintenance work order, this is real data from one of our clients here. If you start to reduce, they were spending three hours and change on every corrective maintenance work order. By year two, they dropped that to just under two. And by year three, they were clearly under one hour. That's massive reductions in the amount of time they have to spend on corrective maintenance work orders. That will directly translate into profitability. 
The next one we're going to talk about is Kaizen. Kaizen is really two Japanese words. You can see the characters it's that loosely translated change for good. Um, I like the phrase continuous improvement. It is all about eliminating muda, which is the Japanese word for waste. And everybody in the organization is involved to help identify this waste and to use Kaizen. It's, it's a way of life. It's an everyday everywhere. You see a problem, you know you're going to have to try to fix it in gradual and methodical ways. This was also created in Japanese manufacturing. The Toyota production system made this popular. Um, basically, you know, it, Toyota had this policy when there was a problem on their production lines, all line personnel are expected to stop, they huddle with their manager, and they try to remedy that, that abnormality. They're trying to make it better. And if you continuously do this, it just makes your operations run smoother. 80% of improvements come from frontline employees. That's a highly um, uh, published statistic here. And a Kaizen blitz or rapid movement, there's a variety of ways. That, that's an event that you're going to stop, focus on that particular pro process, identify, and quickly remove those wastes. There are all kinds of ways Kaizen can help drive profitability with CMMS. CMMS is an excellent tool to help identify where you're experiencing problems, your ratio of preventive to corrective maintenance. Set up a KPI uh, and see where are you standing for that. And if the numbers are not a good balance of preventive to corrective, that's an area that you're going to have to stop and focus on. The next area we're going to talk about is Six Sigma. Now, this is a very technical one. This is a Six Sigma initi initiatives are pretty heavy, uh, but they're incredibly valuable in terms of driving profitability. It's a technique or a tool set that's all about process and quality improvement by removing causes of defects and minimizing variability. So if you think back to your high school statistics or math, you know, you've got standard deviations away from the average. 99.7 or three sigmas, three standard deviations. And I thought that's pretty good, 99.7% of the time. But if you get out four, five, six sigmas there, you are expected to be 99.99966% defect-free. That is highly accurate. So it's, a con it's continuous efforts to get at those predictable, stable process results. Um, it's all about quantifying financial returns. This should be driven because we need to figure out where we can be better at creating profitability and we start to find that root cause. So strong leadership from management to back you in that research. Heavy decisions on um, verifiable data statistical methods. And Six Sigma is unique in that it has a martial arts belt style ranking. You'll hear people are Six Sigma green belt, Six Sigma black belt. You kind of progress in the educational process. There's two flavors of Six Sigma, DMAIC and DMADV. I'm only gonna talk about briefly DMAIC. The other one is more about starting whole new processes. I find that DMAIC is more geared for maintenance operations because you're fixing existing processes. And it's a circular thing. You can see in that circle on the right there, starts off by defining what are our goals? What are our customers asking us to improve on? What is our management asking us to improve on in terms of that variability and that quality of the products we produce? You gotta then measure what are we currently processing, collect that data and capture that as is uh, capability. So you gotta find a good starting point. And then you're gonna analyze that. You gotta get to the root cause figure out where we can identify where those problems are happening. And this may be coming from engineering and production, but they're going to need data for maintenance operations. You will contribute in a Six Sigma initiative. You're going to make improvements, fix it, run tests, examine, and then you get kind of get in that control mode where you're catching those problems before they ever occur. Six Sigma will, bet, will improve efficiency, timeliness, accuracy, controls, internal policy compliance, really helps you with your customers. You've got a more consistent, better produced product in a more efficient and, and timely manner, and as well as regulatory compliance. And at the end of the day, it's going to reduce operational costs. It's going to drive profitability as a result. You can see some numbers here. Six Sigma was originally created by Bill Smith at Motorola in 19. 
86, but GE and Jack Welsh and, and General Electric's heyday, they made that a centerpiece to their process, saving hundreds of millions of dollars. And you can see on the bottom there, Johnson & Johnson, TI, uh, lots of money can be saved if you go through that. CMMS can support you in this process, especially in the measure and analysis phases. It's going to help you identify where are your bad actors, where is your downtime coming from, where can you help identify where we need to focus on. So another profitability spotlight here with a client of ours, and you'll, you'll see I get this theme of moving your ratio of corrective to preventive um, maintenance. The more you can get away from corrective and the more you can get into preventive, this customer, for every 1% increase they go in their ratio, we're going from corrective to preventive, saves them 26 plus K annually. And that's easy math to do because you can see what is the average cost of a preventive maintenance work order as opposed to a corrective maintenance work order. You can see how much that can really save you. Six Sigma and similar initiatives can help you with that. So the next area we're going to talk about, this is the last of the best practices we'll talk about. We'll dive into some more CMMS examples on this is total productive maintenance. This is one of my favorites, and I think it can really tightly be integrated into maintenance operations. TPM, total productive maintenance, was uh, created by Seichi Nakahima, and it's a, it's a plant improvement methodology and enables continuing and rapid improvement uh, through use of employee involvement, employee empowerment, and closed loop measurement results. It is a lifestyle change for an organization going through TPM. It has multiple pillars. We are only going to focus on autonomous maintenance for this lecture today. You notice at the bottom of all those pillars is 5S. 5S is a foundational methodology that, that sits underneath just about everything we're talking about today. TPM is a changing mindset thing. It's, it's, it's everybody in the organization owning and essentially loving the assets they have to work on. So take a car, for example. You drive out of that showroom with that brand new car. You're probably not going to let your kids eat in the car. You're going to take it to the car wash once or twice a week. You're going to put the best gas in it. You're going to pay attention to every little rattle. You let that go, like that car on the right, you're not going to be able to tell when you have a leak. You're not going to be able to hear the rattle and you're not going to be able to care if people eat in your car. You, you stop loving that asset and it go, lets go as a result. TPM is an optimal relationship between people and equipment. Everybody's involved. The operators, so production-oriented people, maintenance, everybody is involved. It's a cross-functional approach and it involves all departments. And typically, when you're going through TPM initiatives, implementation is going to be through small group teamwork. This is the proverbial failure is the tip of the iceberg. So when you have downtime, when your assets fail on you, it, maybe it was a, a, a clogged filter that caused overheating and crash and burn. But you look at what was the real source of that failure, wear, play, slackness, leakage, vibration, noise. There's tons of abnormalities that can possibly affect that asset. Many of them are hidden. You've got to expose those and catch them early before these problems happen. And when you do that, the goals, and these are the published goals of total productive maintenance, zero accidents, zero downtime, zero defects, and zero speed losses. That's a really lofty goal, but that's what you're aiming for. Minimizes the life cycle cost. It's going to prevent that dreaded profit-killing downtime. It's going to involve you having to potentially modify equipment to prevent those breakdowns or at least to make maintenance easier. And maybe even going back to designing and installing assets that need little or at least less maintenance to achieve these goals. Autonomous maintenance is one of the pillars within total productive maintenance. And I think it's really tightly related to maintenance operations. It's, it's about improving routine inspection and maintenance. It's promoting early detection of those abnormal conditions. And it's really trying to control those chronic losses, those chronic problems that lead to those profit killers that we've been talking about, especially downtime. It's a collaborative team activity, not just maintenance technicians, 
are responsible for maintenance in your organization. It's really everybody's responsibility, production, engineering, maintenance. Everybody is responsible for those assets. It also helps develop operating and maintenance skill sets. You're, you're really improving what those operators can do within, within limits uh, what you allow them to do. And CMMS is a great way to uh, identify those activities, implement them, create those steps. And we're going to go through some of those examples. So the operator. The operator is just like that car we talked about. They own that asset, and they need to have some loving care for that asset. That goes beyond just doing their, their typical daily processes. So they're going to find it, fix it, and keep it fixed. To find it, I inspect and detect small defects, preventive maintenance, PDM, operator care techniques. Fix it, hopefully return it to nor optimal. And if they can't, then they get it in the, in the loop with the maintenance operations team. And again, we want to keep it fixed. We want to eliminate those chronic problems. So there are some aspects of TPM are you're going to have to do things like get your equipment back to a state where you can really identify when problems are going to happen. Um, that asset on the left, and these are technically the same assets shot from different angles before and after a TPM initiative where somebody went to town on that asset on the left, cleaned it, painted it, everything they needed to do to get it back. It was a total refurbishment. But when you look at that asset on the left, how are you going to tell if there's a leak? How are you going to smell a problem? How are you going to see or hear things? That asset on the right, so much more easier for an operator or anybody to take a quick look and see are there problems potentially developing that will snowball. You also may be re-engineering certain aspects of your operations, changing the cover on this particular um, belt and gear uh, you couldn't see the problems in the previous example. You can identify those wobbles, and you can hear and you can see them. So you may be having to take steps like this. You will also be empowering your, your, your uh, um, operator team to perform basic preventive uh, and theoretically corrective actions, at, say, at the beginning of a shift, daily basic care. It's real easy to set up in a CMMS solution basic instructions to clean, to tighten, to lubricate, that your operator staff will perform daily, weekly, whatever the appropriate is. And they can be assigned directly to those individuals. The bottom line is these operators, again, they're just as responsible for quality maintenance and really responsible for catching those problems, those abnormalities, very, very early. And having these inspections can really help. They also can take... Um, meter readings, uh, usage data, and enter them into your CMMS, whether it's on a browser or on a mobile device. But this data, how many hours does this run? What is the temperature? What it, whatever the different data or metrics that can be entered daily, whatever, whatever frequency, they may trigger both preventive, say you hit a certain number of hours or certain cycle counts, or even corrective. Maybe you're entering a value uh, of a delta on either side of a filter that would indicate a clogged filter needs to get changed. So if you can catch that stuff very early by the operator, fix it. So you're going to inevitably create maintenance requests, possibly directly into maintenance work orders. They're going to show up in your queue as a maintenance operations team so you can address them. But they're going to get in that loop, and they're going to get properly prioritized so that we can get them fixed sooner than later. Again, trying to stay way ahead of those dreaded downtime type situations. Documentation to assist in how you manage these assets can be managed through your CMMS. And basically just a good way to, to watch and see um, how well your assets are performing. Have all that data that um, is available in your CMMS. Set up key performance indicators and charts and look at the dashboards to identify where are those sources of profit killers coming from. And that can be all geared for the appropriate users in the system. But again, you, gotta, you have to really know the root cause of this data and see that at your fingertips and share it with appropriate people. TPM and autonomous maintenance in, in, in particular benefit. You're going to stabilize that equipment condition. Basically, you're going to eliminate or halt 
that deterioration. You see that plain as day with those assets that have been refurbished, and you put that money into and that time into making those, and they're going to last and operate so much better. You're also going to catch abnormalities way earlier, especially if you have that little army of operators that are physically with that asset each and every day to catch those problems. Inspection and maintenance, both for the operator and for the maintenance technician, become a lot easier. And you're increasing skill levels. I think it can be empowering to give these basic chores, tasks, I should say, to your operators at the beginning or the end of their shift, you know, develop their relationship with that asset to make it be a happier, just like the happy boat. You, 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 it's just so much better, and they get some skill increase out of it. You get better predictability. Um, you're reducing downtime and preserving or stretching the life of that asset. It's not hard to see that doing all these things we're talking about are going to reduce costs, which in turn will improve that profitability. The last profitability spotlight I have here is an, another client of ours, and you can see in a three-year period what their overall maintenance operation spend this came right off their their, bud, their, their, uh, their, their financial statements went from 3.8 million down to 1.7 million. Um, that's pretty amazing drop uh, in what they're spending in their maintenance operations through a combination of a well-implemented CMMS system and using some of these different methodologies and best practices that we've talked about today. A couple of final slides here. I always like to talk about the impact of COVID-19, especially as it pertains to today's lecture. And, and one of the things that I think that we've learned um, in this pandemic as maintenance operations prof professionals is the importance of lean maintenance operations, which really can be supported by CMMS. You hear this phrase, um, doing more with less. How can we be really efficient? And it's not about eliminating jobs. It's about just being really smart with our parts, being really smart with our safety and compliance, being really smart with our work orders management, and, and how we achieve lean maintenance operations. It has been absolutely critical that you do that in this pandemic. Whether you're busy, you know, you've got organizations that are making PP&E and and are, are much busier than usual because of the pandemic. And then you have all kinds of people that have been unfortunately impacted in the other direction where they've slowed down. Either way, if you're busy, you gotta just make sure you're incredibly efficient at, uh, about how you're doing your maintenance operations because you wanna minimize that downtime at all costs. If you're real slow, well, CMMS has a number of areas that it can help you maybe analyze where you can make improvements or maximize the efficiency of your team and staff because you know every dollar is precious. So what you learn through this lean maintenance operations will really benefit you in a pandemic. It also happens to lead nicely into the changing and aging workforce. The changing and aging workforce is something that's been brewing for, for quite a while now, but 50% of our maintenance operations staff, really all operations staff, are set to retire in the next 10 years. We are an aging society, and we're about to see a huge percentage of very knowledgeable veteran people leave our workforce. Well, we need to capture that information in our CMMS because we need to know what these people do. Fast forward that to the pandemic, it's really important that you know how to go ahead and perform maintenance tasks. And you may have people that can't come into the office because maybe they're susceptible to COVID-19. They have underlying health conditions. They're older veteran people. You need to get that knowledge and your CMMS is a, is a great way to help do that. That's extra supported by this work from anywhere uh, policy that everybody is gravitating to. Even in the manufacturing world, I'm amazed with what percentage of people can get serious amounts of work, obviously not touching assets, but a lot of other things can be done in a CMMS solution from the safety of your own house, supported by the cloud. You've got to be able to have access to that software from anywhere, but also your mobile devices can really help you. So 
um, CMMF basically is, is helping clients in this COVID-19 pandemic, but it'll be helping you in the next curveball, whatever it may be, because it helps support these lean maintenance operations, which is greatly complemented by these best practices and methodologies, which we've discussed today. So in recap and wrapping it up, so the spectrum of maintenance operations, that firefighting mode we see in the bottom left, so often we hear um, people come to our solutions because that's just what they're doing. They spend their days moving from one fire to another. You can move from that firefighting mode and get into that calm, cool, um, proactive environment through implementing CMMS, especially complemented by 5F and Six Sigma and TPM that we talked about today, the combination of the two just creates a much better environment which will help drive that profitability. It's a continuous improvement process. I don't want anybody to be intimidated by the lecture content today. There is a lot thrown at you, especially around these different high-level discussions on 5F and Six Sigma, you got to take baby steps on all of this, whether it's your CMMS implementation or, or how can CMMS help benefit a TPM, autonomous maintenance initiative. Food Solutions is here to help. You, you can reach out. We can coach you through that process of where to take this conversation to the next step. You're going to have to pick your biggest areas of concern and work from there which one of these methodologies are going to help. And you can, if you think back to like 5S, I mean that, that's a foundational thing, but some of these others like op involving operators, you, know, you, you, you identify where can we really benefit from this. You're going to have to get your team involved. Maybe you are already seeing some of these initiatives going on in your organization. You now will be a little bit more oriented to them where you can get involved. But get your team involved in this. Get their buy-in that there really are improvements. It is a continuous improvement process. Little baby steps create progress. And progress is a really contagious thing. And that's where you'll start to see some of these improvements in these operational efficiency um, uh, metrics that I have on the screen there. And that's where you'll really start to see the controlling of the costs, which will drive that profitability. Okay, I want to thank you. I'm going to go ahead and pass this on to, um, we've got one more final poll that's going to appear on your screen. Uh, if you could just take a moment to fill out this final question. And I'm going to pass this back over to Kevin so we have some time for Q&A. All right, thanks, Paul. That sounds great. Uh, I just want to give everybody a second to uh, uh, complete the poll. Uh, you might give me a... a a nod when I'm ready to move forward. Uh, but are you ready to answer some questions from the audience, Paul? I am. All right. Well, to our audience, type your questions for Paul in the Ask a Question box on your screen. We will get to as many questions as time allows. Questions that we do not get today will be posted online with the archived version of the webcast. To download a certificate of completion, a copy of the presentation, and other resources, Use the Event Resources tab on the left-hand side of the screen. All right. Um, I'm going to move ahead. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to, but I'm going to. There we are. We just talked about that. Um, as far as questions go, Paul, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, coronavirus. It, is it the case that functionality for the hygiene associated with coronavirus prevention and other kinds of um, uh, hygiene standards, are they being incorporated into EAM? Is it fair to say that the EAM or CMMS system is going to be the host of any kind of functionality that follows from uh, the need to combat the virus? If it isn't, it, it, it better be in your organization. It has to be. And, and you know, whether it's co coronavirus, uh, PP&E policies, sanitization, or um, anything like uh, lockout tagout procedures or any safety-related issues, you should rely on your CMMS EAM to incorporate 
what are those step-by-step procedures? What is that documentation that you have to follow um, and should be part of the record of those uh, preventive maintenance routines or whatever it may be? It's a natural place for those to be included uh, to the point where a lot of our clients will use, say, a digital signature to sign off that they are complying when they perform those steps. So, yeah, if, if you're not doing that, you really need to focus on it for sure. Good. And I would imagine a lot of your clients are, you know, classified as essential companies or essential manufacturers. Uh, have, uh, have they turned to you or have you had any insight into what kind of changes they've had to undertake to um, uh, continue to be productive in the midst of the uh, pandemic? I mean, it's certainly true that millions of people are working from home. But I think when you come down to the essential manufacturing steps, it, it almost by definition that you have people there, right? Yeah, they have to be in there, but you're going to be defining um, policies and procedures. You know, I, I, one example um, that I saw with, some, with one of our clients' data is establishing protocols for when contractors were starting to be allowed to come back on premise to perform maintenance duties, you know, say beyond the critical ones. And, so I was able to see client data where, you know, they have check, contractor checklists that they have to adhere to, which become essentially part of the system of record around the preventive maintenance process that they're going to have to adhere to. So, yes, whether it's social distancing policies as part of the record um, or whatnot, it's in there. And, and, and an interesting side note, if anybody wants to dive into that topic, I've actually lectured on this a couple of times um, over the past couple of months. So that will be available in our in our website, uh, you can see links to these types of topics. But yes, the, the, C, the role of EAM and CMMS uh, operationally and documentation and compliance um, is, is, is very, very important, for sure. Good. And um, here I have a rather blunt question from one of our listeners. I have a CMMS and don't get the benefits you describe in this webcast. How can that be corrected? <laughs> you know, um, a lot of people who are unhappy with their CMMS implementations, you know, it comes down to it's it's more than the software. Um, it's it's is it well implemented? Did you get the right training? Is the quality of your data in the system supporting your operational needs? Of course, is it a good product? I'm very proud of our product, and I've been around this world for a long time. Um, so you've got to start with a quality system. But you also have to make sure you have those good foundational starting points. And I don't want people to think that oh, that takes tons and tons of uh, consulting hours and it's expensive. You got to find that right balance of get the right solution and the right organization to really help you make sure you get off on the right foot. And if you do that, I assure you, you will see those improvements. And you saw the examples throughout this presentation today of the real dollar savings uh, that can absolutely dwarf the original cost to implement technology like this. Well, before today's webinar started, Paul, you had said that you would be focusing more on best practices today than technology per se. Uh, but you did talk about predictive maintenance, and, and I associate that very closely with a couple of different technologies, uh, one of them being the uh, uh, Internet of Things and the other being, you know, the the growth of analytics use. A uh, couple of questions I'd like to ask there. Number one, do you see a lot of demand from your installed base for acquiring the technologies that can make that more possible? And, um, you know, what, how deep does that go into your installed base? And, and do you in, also see it as dependent on technology? Yeah, that, that's a very good observation. Um, and I'll use an example that ties directly into the presentation today, and that's the operator. One of the things we talked about, the operator physically entering run hours or temperature checks or cycle counts or any other numerical value that might indicate either a, a corrective action needed or possibly some preventive maintenance needed. That is a perfect example of where the Internet of Things can be used so that instead of the operator having to type that value in, have that data just come straight in. Um, they shouldn't have to type it in by hand. They, don't, they won't make a mistake that way. And it gets automatically into the system at whatever frequency is, 
is desirable by the, by the organization. It, it frees up that operator's time to perform some of these other tasks that have to happen in the physical world. So yes, technology, the internet of things, or like you said, like that big data, all that data, when you look at a Six Sigma um, analysis relies heavily on statistical information. You're going to have to identify your bad actors. Where is your downtime coming from? Under what scenarios is that data coming from? That's where you start to find those lakes of data that can be used for those predictive analytics. So yes, Dude Solution, we are focused on both sides of that conversation. Um, it, it's, it's where the market is going, um, and I think it'll be uh, yet another way that will really help drive profitability through reducing costs. Uh, in your presentation, you talked about a range of best practices and methodologies, some of them historical, some of them very, very contemporary. Uh, one of our listeners asked, if I wanted to learn more about these best practices and methodologies, where should I turn? That's a very good question. And, and then one of the things I said at the beginning of the presentation, today was an orientation, you know, a, a 5,000 foot view um, of these different methodologies. And there's a lot of other methodologies. So if you are a part of an organization that you've heard Kaizen, or you've heard that TPM is something that's been discussed, hopefully this presentation will give you enough of an orientation um, you are going to have to continue that education. And there is a variety of resources. I mean, there is just tremendous videos and websites on how to get started with autonomous maintenance or the fundamentals of Six Sigma or 5S. So I would, I would suggest that you, if, if, and again, if, if you're not hearing about it in your organization, but you're thinking, you know, this could really help us in our organization, I would recommend that you go deeper. You start to look around, use the internet, find some sources of official training. I know Six Sigma, for example, many community colleges offer Six Sigma um, courses where you can get your green belt in a day or even an afternoon, um, and then you can progress through some much, much greater educational steps in that. But you, know, you got to go on your own now and figure out where are the best sources, whether it's within your organization or you're going to try to find them to introduce to your organization, but dig in, dig deeper, because and, 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 it will benefit you. Well, one of the benefits of um, EAM and best practices, the way you've been talking about, is increased compliance. Uh, is there a, a defined set of regulatory or regulations that um, apply in, in this case, I mean, I think it's always interesting when the need to apply with a regulatory regime is one of the main justifications for investing in an enterprise or other type system. But at the same time, you know, the regulations are very important. What are the most, what are the ones that you most often run into? Well, by far, ISO. Um, and, and whether it's a 9,000 family, which is really about your quality management, um, very broadly speaking, CMMS, EAM, is not going to make you compliant. It's going to help you in your compliance journey. Uh, and there are certain aspects, like ISO, for example, where you absolutely have to have an automated preventive maintenance process. You won't pass your ISO audits if you don't have that process automated, clearly defined and automated. So there's certain functionality that's absolutely um, foundational in CMMS. But there are, it's a lot of the other things that are a little bit more nebulous where when the auditor wants to see a history on something or look at your, your process around uh, different aspects of your maintenance operations, which will be largely documented in your CMMS solution. Now you cross over to more specialized ones like FDA, CFR, that type of stuff where you are going to have to provide more quantitative data in that journey, get into the statistical analysis, you know, there are that. But I think ISO by far and a well-implemented CMMS solution, uh, let, me put, let me say it this way. Um, we have many clients who have come to us because they struggled with their ISO compliance, implemented a CMMS, and it goes night and day better. You, you, you hear comments like, 
you know, as soon as I, the auditor was with me and I ran through a couple of reports, what took hours in a previous visit from the auditor took minutes because they were able to just show that documentation and show those best practices, show that quality management within their EAM solution. Cool. I actually remember the days when I don't think you mentioned statistical process control uh, completely, and that may be more of an operations thing than a maintenance thing, but you did talk about Six Sigma. And, and in a way, statistical process control and Six Sigma were really ahead of their time because now that those were in some sense, they were kind of semi-automatic or semi-manual processes. And now with the uh, uh, availability of computing power like we could have never imagined in those days, we've got a whole range of analytics that are um, being made available to us in, in really all walks of life from baseball to uh, manufacturing. But uh, um, I was just interested in uh, if you had any thoughts about the growth of analytics and what that is doing to change EAM and CMMS systems. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, an interesting conversation. You know, SPC, and whether it's, it, whether it's that um, methodology or the Deming cycle, um, engineering process control, lean and the theory of constraints, there's so many different processes. I, I have to be careful not to profess to be an expert in any of these, but to know that they, they are very similar in many ways because they are around that continuous improvement process. They're all about making those improvements, and many of them do rely on lots of data to make uh, good determinations of both identifying root cause and, and identifying where we can make those corrections. You can't do that without the data. You can't do that without having um, lots of data, especially as you get into Six Sigma. So I, I, think, I just think the advent of the way we are able to manage large quantities of data, how we embrace and, and understand the importance of capturing that data is just driving a revolution of predictive type um, capabilities which just create for the better they're not they're not simple it's it's not a silver bullet magic wand you know these things take work they take analysis but i think the tools the availability of the data as well as the mindset of organizations because you can look back at those examples from ge and uh the dollars that they save those are pretty compelling stories that there is an ROI to go through that, any of those um, just made so much easier with the way we can acquire data and manage and, and visualize data today. Here's an interesting but perhaps dangerous question from one of our listeners. And they're asking, does union or non-union craft make difference in labor costs? I think it's obvious that it probably would make a difference in labor costs. But just anecdotally speaking with your experience across a broad range of manufacturers, do you find that makes a difference in labor quality? I'm going to be really careful not to answer that question. I, you know, I, I think I, I can um, say that with CMMS, you're able to measure the productivity of your team, and you're able to measure the productivity of who those individuals are, what those crews are, what those crafts are, what's the source of that labor, be it outside contractor, be it in-house labor, be it in-house non-labor. But to answer the question of cost savings and quality and correlation of any of those, you need to go back to the data and you need to go back to the analysis. And that's where you can rely on, on a CMS EAM solution to help spotlight, you know, again, whether it's labor-oriented or it's sources of downtime, it just gives you that that tool set to help identify, and then if you can identify, you can you can make better. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, one other kind of off the wall question, uh, in terms of just your anecdotal knowledge, you talked about the uh, connection between the coronavirus and uh, retirement of um, uh, an aging workforce. Have you? come upon any instances where you found people that were retiring uh, simply because of ongoing concerns related to the coronavirus? 
You know, I personally have not. I wouldn't be surprised to hear that. I will, I will say this. The opposite was happening prior to COVID-19 in that people who wanted to retire, uh, the data is overwhelming that organizations are having, were, this is pre-pandemic, having a hard time filling those roles, especially of people with the skill set needed to, to maintain these assets. So organizations were absolutely becoming more flexible in retaining people that would like to retire, but hey, maybe getting them to go down to part-time or contract um, or even phone from home type. And, and that's where the pandemic and Zoom can be of value. I mean, you, the tools that we use and the way we can interact with our coworkers, even if we're miles and miles apart, is aided with cloud-based software, mobile, things like Zoom and video chat and things of that nature. So, I, of course, I don't think anybody would be surprised if people are like, you know, I'm out. Um, you know, I've got um, lung issues. I, I just can't be around. It's not worth it. But there are still opportunities for those people with this work from anywhere concept. Um, I think as the pandemic starts to wane, uh, these people will be enticed back into the workforce because there's just not going to be enough people to fill these skilled jobs until we as a sort of a manufacturing culture and society start to create those educational opportunities uh, to fill these jobs uh, with, 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 with the quality, with the people that can do them. It's been very interesting. I've, I know a number of instances where uh, companies have said, you know, even coming out of the pandemic, this has gone so well and everyone has stayed so productive that we're going to continue to allow you at least to a limited degree to work from home uh, even after we turn to what will be the new normal, I suppose. All right, the final question is the number one question for any technology or software investment, and that's uh, that is this following. I've been trying to get my management to consider us getting maintenance software, but I get pushback on cost. What are the top cost savers or what is the return on investment in a, a CMMS or EAM system? Yeah, you know, this is, this is an absolutely common either question or resistance from people being on the sales side of CMMS world for my, my, my career is people only think about the cost of, of implementing a solution. You just simply have to get away from that. I mean, there was numerous examples that, that one client that cut by $2 million their maintenance spend. I mean, that, that is a big client. They have obviously a large maintenance budget in there. Um, that's paid for their CMS so many times over. And, and that's just one of many examples. Look at the benefits, look at the ROI. So if you just sort of pick, where is your pain coming from? If it's unexpected downtime that you, you just really crushed you um, or a stock out where it, it was extending the downtime and you look at the math of what does it cost you for that downtime and you compare that to what does it cost for you to implement the CMMS, it is, it is overwhelmingly obvious if you look at the overall benefits, you look at the overall cost savings. Uh, and the profitability drivers, the return on investment as opposed to the initial cost, it's really hard for management to say no to a solution like that. And if they are saying no, well, I would <laughs> I'd wonder about the future of that organization if they just can't see that map. Uh, well, thanks everyone for uh, your questions today and thanks to uh, our speaker, Paul the Chance for sharing his time and expertise. I'd also like to extend special thanks to our sponsor, uh, Dude Solutions, for their support in putting on this event. Uh, and now that we're just about done, we'd like to hear how we did. The exit survey will pop up on your screen as soon as the webcast ends. Please take a moment to complete it because we use this information to improve our webcasts. Finally, on behalf of Plant Engineering and Dude Solutions, I'd like to thank you for attending. That concludes our webcast. Thanks, and see you next time. Thanks, everybody.